This is episode 89 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Buddy Rushing. Buddy is the CEO and founder of White Feather Investments. Their mission is to educate and empower military members to achieve financial freedom through real estate investing. He is a former Marine. Uh, Buddy, welcome to the show. Shin, I want to say publicly, I'm a co-founder. My, the other founder is my wife, Kimberly. Oh, and if okay. she heard you say that I'm the only founder. She would come right to your doorstep. Yeah. And you are <laughs> both in the picture, but it said founder. But that, that's very important, though, because there's a lot of husbands and wives, partners who have found these together. So we'll definitely get into that. I'm excited to talk to you about it. Uh, first, I want to know is when was the first time that you remember real estate being something in your mind that, you know, became what it is now? Like, When was the first time you remember yeah. thinking like, "Ooh, that could be something? I remember exactly the first time I Great. was uh, on deployment to Afghanistan in 2005, and we were in Southeast Petika province, and that was when everybody was in Iraq. So Afghanistan was the absolute wild west. And so I was on an embedded training team, which is a small team of Marines that goes in and embeds with the Afghan soldiers and teaches them how to fight, you know, teaches them how to patrol and do all this other stuff. And then you take them into combat. And we were on a long range what's called a reconnaissance patrol. And we were in an armored, be armored vehicles, basically. And so I was in this armored vehicle and, and what happens when you're in this long row of armored vehicles, trying to go somewhere through IED infested yeah. terrain, is it slow? It's so slow. So you think you see movies and it's like these people just blasting down the road <laughs> and it's not the case. You go so slow, right? Because an IED can, can destroy a vehicle. But like they're armored vehicles. So if you get ambushed, you don't care. We've got bigger guns than they do. So you, yeah. you don't mind going. So a lot of people don't realize that they're like, oh, you drop so fast and prevent ambushes. No, we'll, we'll smoke them if they ambush us. But if yeah. you get an IED, it's done. Right. Right. And so that was the mentality, at least. So anyway, all that to say, we were going very slow for a very long amount of time and I was <laughs> bored. And so I was sitting in that what's called the A driver's seat, which is the passenger seat and you know, I, I was looking around and, and I looked between, to my left between the seat and the radio mounts. There was a little purple book under there. And so I pulled out this book and you know, of course, exactly what yeah. we're talking about. It was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I read Rich Dad. I read it out of sheer boredom. And I remember about a two, three pages in, I was like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. And I read the entire thing. And then I read the entire thing again. Yeah. You know, it's a quick read. You can read it in, you know, a few hours and it's a simple book, right? It's not this like big, complex academic study. It's a very simple book. And it convinced me that my past didn't have to equate to my future because I, I grew up in East Tennessee on food stamps. And so like, you know, we, that's all I knew. I, I you know, being wealthy wasn't a possibility in my town growing yeah. up. I know from my previous military guests that they didn't either because they all oh. found the the book or something similar while they were on deployment to figure out, hey, what's that going to be like? And some didn't figure that out till they got home. And then it's it's harder. You, there's no plan in place at that point. Yeah, exactly. And so you're what you see people, they they serve in the military and then, you know, they get out. And a lot of times their life and their lifestyle degrades after service. For sure. Lot, that's the common story, right? And it's, it's unfortunate. It doesn't have to be that way. It's just, you know, whenever people, whenever you're, especially in like the Marine Corps, you're in a very structured environment. You're told where to be, what to do. You're supported in all aspects. You're supported financially. You have a mission and a purpose. As soon as you leave, as soon as you take off the uniform, all of that goes away. Yeah. Right. The income, the camaraderie, the community, the structure, the mission and the purpose. All of it goes away. Yeah. Imagine what that does to your system. Yeah. I think from the outside, some people could think like, oh, great. You finally have freedom. But it's like, well, I don't even know what to do. You're used to just be going through your day, looking at the schedule and everything is so, you know, has to be on point or else it's not going to work out. And then, you know, you're home adjusting to something new, but also having to figure out like, OK, well, if I'm out now for good what's the scale like you know a lot of it, if you went in when you were young it's not like you you're coming out knowing like hey i know what exactly what i'm going to do right now yeah exactly and that unknown i mean it, it really does um 
it, it, the training obviously doesn't really prepare you for that, right? The training prepares you to do the ordinary in extreme situations. Well, how often in the civilian world do you need to do the ordinary in extreme situations? Yeah. No, you're mostly uh, doing the ordinary in ordinary situations, right? Yeah. W- waiting and, in a, waiting in an SUV in a car line at school to pick up kids isn't really the same as driving through a field with these <laughs> IDs. I mean, the, right? yeah. but the stresses are nevertheless real. They're just different. And so, you know, for me to answer your question, um, that, that book allowed me to dream and to, and to get, gave me permission to believe that I could create, I could change the legacy of poverty that my family had come from. Yeah, but that's all I had. I had that dream and that sounds romantic, but if you don't pair that with pragmatic, actionable education, then you get hurt. And that's what happened to me. Yeah. Was there, was there, sorry, was there something though about the fact that you weren't, you were still losing money, but you were still, you were also making money. Did you start to see the voyage like if it just wasn't in a crash that like long term you thought you could get through it because money was coming in, even though it wasn't as much as you had hoped? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it was really just about survive, right? Just hold on and survive. But instead of, you know, like instead of focusing on what we we were losing and, and how to mitigate the pain and the damage, what we had realized was that you can... Like if we're going to get to our dream of financial freedom, then we're going to have to create more positive income streams. And here's an opportunity. There's an opportunity in every single crash, in every single disaster, mistake, lesson. There's an opportunity there. And I had one of my mentors tell me one time, like never, ever waste a good opportunity to learn something, yeah. right? And, and, and your mistakes and your failures are those best opportunities to learn. They're way more than your successes. You're not going to yeah. learn much from your successes. You're going to start getting tempted to think that you're awesome and, and exactly, you know, yeah, right, yeah. Then you'll how, get a how you'll many get people, a bigger one. Think about this: how many people started investing in 2000, 2001, and then by 2006 they were writing books and and appearing on podcasts and teaching educational courses because everything they touched turned to gold. Yeah. Remember that, right? Yeah, oh, I remember. Were in business in 2009. Yeah, <laughs> right? no, they went bankrupt in Texas buying eighty, you know, ninety units. Uh, on very, very high leverage. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that's that. I think the, I'm very grateful that my first experience, um, and I dragged my wife into this as well, uh, cause she was my girlfriend and then we ended up getting married while we were doing this. And so yeah. we, we started out our marriage. I had a negative net worth. I was like, it can only go up from here. Yeah. I mean, that's a great partnership. And I do, I, I, I've talked to a lot, so many people, uh, all spouses or partnerships of any kind, everybody's on board. It's very hard to be successful, sorry, as a real estate investor, if your partner or even just your family is not on board with the venture, if they start in with, oh, you're crazy, you know, go get a regular job, you know, did that having you guys kind of doing it together really help keep fueling it forward, especially because you kept, you know, you get deployed two, three more times. You really need to know like, okay, she's got it handled at home. And I can, you know, work on this stuff uh, too when I can. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to, man, I, so now I do, um, part of what this evolved into is people wanted me to train them how to do it as well. So I can yeah. focus on military veterans and their families, but I, tra- but I've trained hundreds and hundreds of people on how to do this. And one of the things that I always say is if you're fortunate enough that your spouse is on board, then run with it, be grateful for it. Make sure they know how grateful you are that they're on board. Because the common story is that the spouse is either passively supportive or openly hostile. Yeah. That, that's the most common, right? Yeah. The, the, the that one sucks. In, yeah. <laughs> and, and you see it all the time. It's like, you know, somebody that like all they're doing is saying, man, real estate's too risky or real estate's a scam. I literally heard someone tell me like literally that sentence, real estate is a scam. I'm like, I don't even know what that means.